If you like our videos, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And thanks again to all who have donated to us via our PayPal link. In this video, we will try to understand the relation between art and being. Do works of art help us to know who we are and how the world really is? To recreate ourselves and the world? Or perhaps to rediscover ourselves and our world? Why do you love art? Why do you spend so much time watching shows and films with your screens? Go to museums, galleries, music concerts, read about it, discuss it, live for it. Do you appreciate the craftsmanship put into it? Does it give you pleasure, joy, sense of belonging? Does it evoke your imagination, ignite your love of justice? Probably all of the above. But did you ever think that art can actually question your understanding of what it means to be, who you are, and what you are supposed to do? Art can make us ambivalent about being because it embodies both the real and the unreal, the object and its representation, its copy. But contemporary art began to embody the ambiguity of being, that is, it began to promote the freedom from identity, from order, perfection. The anxiety of the infinite, of the truth with capital T, got replaced with the anxiety of finitude, of having possibilities. This transition is demonstrated by Certified Copy, a film by Abbas Kiarostami. One of the main characters in the film is a writer. In his latest book, he argues that copies of original works of art also have value. The copy also points us back to the original and, as such, preserves its identity for us. It's my intention really just to try and show that the copy itself has worth in that it leads us to the original and in this way certifies its value. And I believe this approach is not only valid in art. I was particularly pleased when a reader recently told me that he found in my work an invitation to self-inquiry to a better understanding of the self. But why do we care so much about original works of art or originality, authenticity, in the first place? Because we believe that works of art can hold the truth about who we are and what we ought to do. We as human beings, as finite beings, who exist and reproduce, can't help it but to keep looking for our origin, the infinite that created us, whether it is God or the Big Bang. This quest is basically a quest after our identity. But in effect, we can only trace the history of our artifacts, the history of what we make. Therefore, in order to find the clues as to who we are or who we have become, we turn to our works of art as a point of reference. Questions about the concept of originality have been discussed throughout history and precede even the time when the Romans were selling copies of Egyptian silver artifacts. My own favorite story is of Lorenzo di Medici instructing Michelangelo to carve his statue of Cupid all'antica so it would fetch a better price. So this concern about originality, the notion of the false and the genuine has always existed and occupied our ancestors' minds as much as it does ours today. The word original has itself for us very positive connotations. Authentic, genuine, reliable, lasting, possessing an intrinsic value. The etymology of the word too is interesting. The Latin root oriri means arising or being born. And I am particularly interested that the word original refers to birth. I would take the idea to its extreme and draw parallels between reproduction in art and reproduction in the human race. After all, it might be said, we are only the DNA replicas of our ancestors. This is why Philistinism, the hate towards art, is a hate towards human projection, artificiality. The Philistines' quest is after the truth about the world as it is, without any human footprint, which the Enlightenment inaugurated and scientific realists today keep pursuing. 
Art then constantly makes us question the nature of being. Is it just a fabrication, something we make, and as such, free to be whoever we want to be? Or is it the case that only by knowing our essence, we can know how we ought to act and be free from evil? After a lecture he gave about his book, the writer goes into an art gallery that sells only copies of famous works of art. The gallery owner who attended his lecture admires his book and his thesis. They travel together by car and foot and begin to talk about his book, art, and life. We're not supposed to be simple, just uh, complex beings. And where's the line between simple person and sim simple mind? Where's the line? <laughs> Tell me. There isn't a simple answer. When they get to a coffee shop, he begins to tell her stories about a mother and her child that seem to be based on her relationship with her own son. This makes her emotional since they are meaningful for her. The copy, the fictional, has some truth in it for her. At some point, he leaves the coffee shop, which gave the gallery owner an opportunity to tell stories as well, to lie in order to bring the truth to life. She tells the coffee shop owner that the writer is her husband, which propels authentic conversation about the meaning of marriage. For the gallery owner, its meaning is to have a shared life with another person. But for the coffee owner, the ideal, the original meaning of marriage is just a possibility, something we shouldn't pursue if it can ruin our lives. Women should leave their husbands alone sometimes for the sake of their marriage. What the coffee shop owner seems to be arguing is that being alone provides men with a sense of identity, with a sense of being independent rather than dependent on their wives, which can make them anxious. Slowly the writer and the gallery owner begin to talk to each other as if they are a couple. Were they a couple all along? Or are they just pretending to be a couple? That is, a copy of a real couple. It seems obvious to me that ultimately people must live their lives for themselves. <laughs> you might be living your life, he might be living his own life, but you're both ruining mine. It doesn't matter, since the gallery owner, who is played by Juliette Benouche, begins to express genuine emotions about the difficulties of being a single mom and being alone. She feels comfortable with the ambiguity of the situation. At some point, they pass by a sculpture in which a female figure puts her head over the shoulders of a male figure, and she tells the writer that this gesture says everything there is to know about the sculpture. This gesture is the meaning, the truth of the sculpture, and not its identity as an artifact or the identities of its subjects. The writer thinks that her claim is ridiculous. But how can it be ridiculous, the gallery owner asks him, if this is the thesis of his book? She mistakenly thought that what he was trying to argue in his book is that the significance of any work of art is its meaning for us and not its authenticity, aura, identity. But what the writer was actually trying to argue is that all works of art, whether they are originals or not, are lies since they are copies of what they are trying to represent. Only their subject matter is the original. Even the Mona Lisa is a reproduction of a real woman named Lisa del Giocondo. Didn't you find it interesting? They say how much they adore their picture, but that it's a copy in the original somewhere else. Because it's in Herculaneo, that's a fact. People have to know that, no? But why? What difference does it make? The original is only a reproduction of the beauty of the girl in the picture. I mean, she's the real original. And I suppose if you look at it like that, then even the Mona Lisa is a reproduction of La Gioconda. And that smile. Do you think that's original, or do you think that uh, Leonardo just asked her to smile like that? <laughs> All right, lecture over. Uh, would you like to invite me for a cup of coffee? Pleasure, let's go. So you mean there's no originals at all, right? Not exactly. There are plenty of originals. Where? You get me that coffee you promised, I'll tell you. It's around the corner, we're going. So where's your original? In your sister's house. Oh, really? In my sister's house? Where? It's her husband. 
The writer appreciates works of art, but he still needed to hold on to the real identities behind them since they are the reason for their existence. For the writer, there is no dependency between being and human representation. The former is the real and the latter a fiction. He represents the human anxiety of being, which art, creativity, propels. For him, art should make us wonder about the truth of being, while for the gallery owner, works of art embody real meaning, truth. And the film as a whole tries to argue that men don't feel comfortable with reproduction and finitude, with change and loss, because they value only the real, that which doesn't change, but causes change. That is why they see everything as a joke, preoccupied with their own death, and admire the infinite instead of having a meaningful life. His private lesson is an hour later than usual, and instead of waiting, he wants to do a hundred things it's gonna take an hour. No understanding of time. He says, I'll go skating, I promise I'll be back on time. But even to get to the skating ring takes over an hour. No, totally unaware of time. Yeah, well, isn't that what we like about them? Right. Just want to have fun and enjoy themselves. Oh, exactly. <laughs> I envy them. Yes, of course, but who's responsible? Who has to deal with the consequences? Us. Well, no doubt. The other day, you know, he was standing in the rain, just wearing a T-shirt, I said, Hey, get in. You, you're going to get soaked. You know what he said? So what? I, I said, no, come on. You, you, you're going to get a cold. He said, so what? I said, I was furious. I said, you'll die. You know what he said to me? I'll die. So what? No doubt, I guess. Oh, yes, no doubt. I'm sure your son's going to have a long, happy, and successful life, but he's quite right. We're all going to die. Nothing lasts forever. Baby. Cemeteries are full of indispensable men. Actually, I think your son's version's better. We're all gonna die, so what? If children stay the obvious, we tell them off. But if we get exactly the same thing from, I don't know, a philosopher or a writer, we, uh, we think it's wonderful. Children just live for the moment. They, they wanna have good fun. They don't think about the consequences of the cost. Well, because we pay for it. They don't even think about that. They don't think about the cost because it's part of the game, not an expense. Oh, come on. All this is, is, is good for books. It, it's nice and clever, but it's, it doesn't ring with the, with, the, with the reality. When you're alone and you're dealing with it, it's fucking hard. It's different. I'm sorry. But sometimes this love of the real can lead them to doubt everything, as Descartes did. They take themselves to be independent, to have an identity that is separate from others and the world. But this picture shatters when they get things wrong and realize that they are dependent on them, that they can't always be centered. How can they take themselves to be if they are always being with others in the world? If they can't be independent and reason about reality from an unconditioned point of view, do they even exist? Are they even real? This is why, in order to recenter himself, Descartes decides to appeal to God, the most perfect, real being. Women, then, are more comfortable with the ambiguity of being with others and being in the world to be dependent on whatever they experience, while men need to have an identity and to identify the world. This is to be independent in an independent world, to rationalize. In his film, 27, Mark Lafia deals more directly with the anxiety of being. For him, art making should be a form of self-forgetfulness, a way to deal with the anxiety of being by creating something new and leaving the old behind. All the people are dancing and they're having such fun. I wish it could happen to me. But if you close the door, you never have to see the day again. You never have to see the day again. The characters in the film ask, who am I? And what am I supposed to do as an artist, a wife, a lover, a woman? Who are my subjects, Lafia asks. Do they play themselves or are they characters in my film? Anxiety begets anxiety. Art as an ongoing dialogue creates more anxiety rather than giving us answers. 
Works of art can make reality unfamiliar to us once again, the same way it is seen by us when we are anxious, in order to help us see it differently. It is always beginning anew, without having a closure, without appealing to the law, the real. It is anarchic, refusing to be ordered. This is why Plato decided that there is either room for art or absolutism in his ideal city. Being and art are in constant conflict. Jesus supposedly died on the cross near the age of 27. The cross symbolizes the crossing between the transcendent and the empirical, between that which has identity, that which is independent, the infinite, the universal, and the copy, that which is dependent, the finite, the particular. Christianity promises that one day the two will unite, and Hegel's philosophy tries to show how their unity becomes more and more complete throughout history. It's more sort of like searching, or more like self-implicating. I don't mean that it's like a self-implicating critique, but I mean more that it's just like about trying to find something like finding a way of living. A critique isn't enough. Like a critique without some aspiration towards redemption is is in a way like um, like deeply ungenerous and ungenerative and kind of just like self-involved and and kind of just horrible at the end of the day. <clears throat> And it's really nice, and I mean, I think like infinite jest is, it's really nice the way that he says it. And I think infinite jest is so um, poignant as a critique, because it's totally about a really ubiquitous problem, which is the addiction to stimulation, be it drugs, be it success, be it entertainment be it love. Um, <clears throat> or like love's a little tricky, but like the addiction to kind of like the sort of heightened emotional state. Maybe you should say the addiction to sex. It's like basically the same kind of idea. Um, and like what does it mean to try to... Like what does it mean to try to live for something bigger than yourself in a world where everything is aimed at this, like, at just satiating those, like, momentary needs of just, like, getting high, fucking, being, you know, getting satiated for this little moment one right after another. But why is the film called 27? 27 also alludes to the Club 27, a club of tormented artists, musicians, and actors like Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Jim Morrison, Basquiat, Janis Joplin, River Phoenix, and others who died all around the same age. But the members of this club didn't live at the crossing between the finite and the infinite, body and mind, the same way Jesus did, but constantly flirted with death, with finitude, they always wanted to be free to be whoever they wanted to be, to act as they wish, rather than being limited by time, reason, which would have forced them to think about who they are and what they have to do. This is why they were so alive, they had lust for life. They didn't see themselves as independent in the first place, but only dependent on their bodies, their artistic instrument, and the bodies of others, their audience. And the moment they didn't have a sense of this dependency, that is, when they weren't on stage or in front of a camera, they had issues dealing with life. <laughs> 27 also refers to the age of James Leary, a successful American artist. The film follows him and his love interest, a female gender studies graduate student who is consumed by sexual and gender ambiguity. Am I a woman? Are you a man? Are we lovers? Why do we need these concepts in the first place? Why can't we be free from identities, limitations, and be free to act as we wish to? So in your mind, this is us, we're still together, or are we, or? I think there's, that's the thing. We don't need to define it. Okay. We should never define this as a relationship, as an exclusive relationship. We should just 
whenever you want to be together, we should be together, enjoy, inspire one another, you know, like support one another. Did you ever have thoughts about like what it would feel to not be a woman? Or no? Did you ever question yourself like whether you do certain things because you are considered like constructed? Are we just playing the parts that we need to in order to sustain the familiar, to sustain our sense of reality? If that's the case, then if we can break free from the roles that we are playing for each other, can we be free from it and create a new reality? Do you want to be the woman or the man? I don't know. I don't want to be bound to any gender constraints either, so... The anxious characters in the film rebel against the liberal identities they must adopt in order to be recognized as individuals and be protected by the state. They rebel against their gender identities. And finally they rebel against the masks they have to put on in order to fulfill their desires and interests, to become successful persons in a modern capitalist society. Leary, for example, tries to figure out how an artist should behave and look in order to be accepted by the art world and be successful. If you can bring like an agency to looking at art and enfranchise people to feel however the fuck they want to feel about it and balance that still with a kind of like emphasis on the idea that art is about building collective literacy. Like on the one hand, it is about conformity because without communication, without language, like we don't have anything to do with each other. But, you know, that doesn't mean that there's like a thing to get. So much of the language that swirls around the art world is this, is this language of getting it. And like press releases like have this like, you know, it's like you read press releases and they've got this like language of like an equation. They're like, so-and-so, Mark Lafia uses materials culled from X history and reappropriates them with Z technical. In order to free them from these personas, Lafia at some point affords them ironic relief. That is, they become aware that they are putting on masks and accept the emptiness of it all. Uh, then again, the interesting part of what's happening right now here is really that if Mark creates he wants to create some sort of encounters, right? That can certainly happen, but then again, we're playing roles. So you're James and I'm and Divina, but you're, you're not really my, James. And, and I'm you're like, in my apartment. I'm in your apartment. I know you for really two hours, room, maybe, or three hours, here. right? So it's like, it's staged in a way, but then also still trying to actually create authentic, Something whatever real. that means, yeah. you know, authentic encounters that trigger maybe new forms. Authentic reactions. Yeah. At other times, Lafia tries to open their world to new meanings, but at the end he decides to fuse them into a mere becoming. Lafia seems to be arguing that we don't need to live in a disembodied abstract world in the first place. Instead of using oppressive and fictitious abstract language that takes us out of our concrete experience in order to know who we are and what we have to do, we should all dance in ecstasy. Let's stop pretending. Let's stop putting on masks in order to be identified and instead be a part of the flux in a Nietzschean fashion. At some point, Lafia lets go and lets everyone and everything fuse together, creating chaos that makes it impossible to make any distinction, to rationalize, to identify, in order to control ourselves and others. He wants his characters in the film to lose themselves to life, to surrender to the whims of their bodies rather than using them in order to fulfill the demands of their formal identities. This is because dancing and moving our bodies aimlessly helps us to forget ourselves and reminds us our potential to initiate a new beginning. When our bodies suffer, we get more attached to our reality and when they are vital, we break away from them. Changing our reality begins with a change in the way we curate our being. Lafia's aesthetics is then meaningful politically. He believes that by communicating only with their bodies, his characters can collapse into one being and become a political revolutionary power. His worry is that they lost their freedom in social life, that they are subsumed to the universal. The only way they can be free is to perpetually say no to everything, 
to be rebels without a cause, to be romantic, avant-garde artists. The free artist always wants to be anonymous. But at the same time, Lafia is also worried that if they will be too free, they will only live according to their own laws, their own particular universals, and there won't be room for community life and morality. If they will live only to be free from the truth, there won't be solidarity between them, and there won't be any room for transgressive political movements. How can they embrace both the 27 Club and Jesus' ethics? How can they make the Holy Spirit like a more punk-like spirit, since religious institutions and modern political procedures are too slow and formal? In short, how can they become now who they really are? That is, a unique, perfect, godlike historical community that can transform everything. <laughs> That happened. <laughs> yeah. oh, no. Okay, your film was sort oh. of a hope for the possibility of openness, or did you have different ideas in this film? I think it is, but at the same time, it's um, it's a reinvention of that destruction of coming back, sort of like a, what's the animal that comes back from Phoenix? The Phoenix. The phoenix that comes back from the ashes, sort of like um, picking up those ashes to create a new reality, even as, as, as surreal or ridiculous as it may sound. Um, you have to create that, you know, you have to continue, or I mean, suicide is the other option, but um, if you're opposed to that, then you have to create yourself a new reality, which in and of itself is already a surreal thing. Lafia's solution for the gap between personal action and political action, the individual and the community, the evil and the good, freedom and judgment, is to set up a condition in which the I and the we can recreate themselves at the same time. If I set myself free at the same time my community as a whole does, there is no need to reconcile between us through impersonal abstract institutions, the state and the church. Life and politics for La Fia, then, should be an ongoing festival. This co-rebirth of body and spirit is what the chorus of Greek tragedy represented for Nietzsche. That is, a nascent state of nature an inception of something out of nothing, out of madness, untruth. But we can't be reduced to earth, to the mother, to a communion, because even in our mother's womb, to be human is already to be in a dialogue with others and the world, to communicate. This means that we can't have an immediate access to the world and others since we are always in an exchange with them. But that doesn't mean that something mediates between us either. Mediation is representational. It refers to the mediation between an idea in our minds and an outside object that caused it. It separates being to inner and outer realms. And since we have better access to our inner realm, our knowledge of being must originate from it, not from our experience. This is the foundation of religion and metaphysical worldview, which understands time as absolute, as a series of independent now points that never change but cause change. But that can't be true because again we constantly express ourselves while at the same time try to understand each other and our world. There is no way to break the communication between us and everything around us. Generally I think translation is so like impossible because like mm, from the basic that like a lot of war in Mandarin is like Totally, I don't know how to translate, or even you pick a dictionary or you write a lot, you spend like a, a lot of paragraphs to describe one word, it's just not, it's always not going to get there. And also, like, especially the, like, uh, like, overall expression, like, now, like, there's a lot of, like, um, consequence, uh, like, a lot of thing to, uh, decide how you to uh, express yourself at the moment, but it's not always to, it's always not going to get there that you really want to say this, like some percentage is just like, 
like trying to add something, but at the same moment you lose something. So yeah. Okay. Like you have to make these really human decisions when you're translating, it seems like, of yeah. what you want to preserve. Yeah. This is the reason why the condition for the possibility of any revolution, whether it is right or left wing revolution, is mistrust and miscommunication that affords a fusion between all people in the name of one idea. It is similar to the Nietzschean return to nature, to a unified flesh that lacks any negative force, any sense of finitude, of the untruth. Human life is not a means to an end, but an end in itself. It is always already meaningful which is the reason why human beings can't be reduced to mere material or ideality, to the one in the first place. Saying no for the sake of personal freedom or universal freedom is equally an abstraction. In order to act together, we first need to rediscover the meaning of our shared lives instead of taking ourselves as separate individuals or one community. Thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And if you like our videos, please support us via our PayPal link.